Hallo. Ja. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. As chairman of the board of the Sergio Vieira de Mello Foundation, and on behalf of Professor Buran, director of the Graduate Institute, I have the pleasure to welcome you to our eighth Sergio Vieira de Mello conference. The theme of this year is a crucial and very topical issue. Mass migration, how can we ensure people's safety and dignity? To discuss this, we have two eminent panelists with us this evening, Peter Maurer and Filippo Grandi. Peter Maurer is well known to many of you as he is the president of the ICRC. In 2008, when he was a Swiss ambassador at the UN in New York, we contacted him asking to help us promote a draft resolution for the creation of a World Humanitarian Day to commemorate those humanitarians who lost their lives in the line of duty and to celebrate humanitarian action. His follow-up action was instrumental towards a General Assembly vote in favor of the observance of such a day. Before taking up his position as president of the ICRC, he was Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bern. Filippo Grandi took up his position as High Commissioner for Refugees in January this year coming back to an office where he worked for over 15 years in the late 80s and 90s. After having been chef de cabinet of the High Commissioner, Mrs. Ogata, he became the UNHCR representative in Afghanistan. There he was appointed the deputy special representative at the UN mission in Afghanistan. From 2005, he served as Deputy Commissioner General of UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, and then as its Commissioner General in 2010. Welcome back to Geneva, Filippo. Our moderator, Corinne Momalvanian, may also be well known to many of you. She has served for many years at the UN in Geneva, New York, Baghdad, and Bangkok. She's been the Director of Information Services and Spokesperson of the UN, and is currently the Director of its Division of Conference Management. As Sergio always had a close link to the Graduate Institute and valued exchanges with advanced students, I have asked Corinne, when we come to the Q&A, to give priority to questions coming from students. Corinne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna Willem. The way we're going to do this then is I will ask our two speakers to uh, make a few brief introductory remarks. Then I'll ask them questions, follow-up questions, uh, to tease more out of them on this important topic. And then we'll open the floor uh, for a, a good half hour, at least, for uh, questions and, and answers from, from you. So I'd like to turn first to Mr. Maurer and uh, ask him to deliver introductory remarks. Thanks a lot, uh, Corinne, and uh, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. When uh, we have a discussion around uh, which is called Sergio Vera de Mello discussion or lecture, uh, I can't remind myself to some of the emblematic moment I lived with uh, Sergio when I was posted to New York and he was the relief coordinator. And one of the memorable moments was when we met several times uh, on Saturday morning jogging around the reservoir. And I asked him at the moment, and. Uh, what he was most afraid, he was just coming back from a mission. And I said, the most dangerous place in the world is the hallways of the United Nations. <laughs> Unfortunately, this, this not, uh, the joke did not prove itself true. And uh, 
there are more dangerous places than the hallways of the United Nations, and he was the first one to uh, uh, to experience it. And I'm glad that uh, in another hat and with another function, I engaged myself to have a day particularly uh, uh, commemorating uh, the security of humanitarian workers, which uh, is abominable, and I have uh, uh, had the opportunity at other occasions to say it. With regard to the issue, let me just uh, very briefly make some eclectic remarks at the beginning, which may be topical as we discuss at the present circumstances, human dignity in times of mass migration. I have always to remind myself when I look at operations of the ICRC that displacement is not a European phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And ICRC at the front line of humanitarian action is uh, confronted with first and foremost the enormous suffering of people because their rights are violated and because international humanitarian law is violated. And the obsession with the European migration issue sometimes let us forget the proportions of what we are discussing. Most people in the world who are displaced by force are displaced not towards Europe, but in the countries where they live. Twice as more people are displaced in the countries where the conflict is taking place. Another important percentage of people are displaced into neighboring countries, and only an infinitesimal group, uh, number of people are displaced beyond their own region, and those displacements are not limited to Europe. We are working together with our partners in the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement along migration routes in the Americas, in Asia, in many other places of the world. As a representative of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, our key approach to preserve dignity is to work along migration routes, to look at vulnerabilities, not necessarily status, not that we don't care about status. Status and law is important. But at the end of the day, we look at vulnerabilities and try to address vulnerabilities along migration routes. We consider ourselves as the first responders on the ground uh, in dealing with the elementary needs in terms of assistance and protection of people displaced by violence. And we try to encourage and to work with our movement partners in order to look at vulnerabilities beyond, to look at migration flows and to see where the biggest needs are. And here comes, of course, the necessity to engage governments in order to respect the laws that protect and allow us to assist uh, uh, migrants and those displaced by force. But also, it is important to look at, at those needs. What we see today is, increasingly, that we are confronted with mixed movements and mixed motives of displacements. It's not the one or the other category which is easily prevails, and therefore, uh, it is not easy sometimes to determine is somebody displaced by violence and because he is persecuted or is he displaced by economic reason. I was the other day on a boat with the Greek Coast Guard uh, in, in the waters between Greece and Turkey. And I spoke to uh, some of the 500 young Syrians who were fished from the water and brought into safety on Lesbos. And when you listen carefully to their destinies, you know these are people leaving and having left for a reason. They have been confronted on the, on the road they, they did with a lot of abuses and a lot of trafficking and smuggling and violations of their own rights. But if you go to the gist, they have fled a situation which is untenable and doesn't allow for a dignified life. There, they were both technical students I spoke to, and both didn't, were not able anymore to continue their studies. They wanted to go to Germany, and they took the, the road to Germany. They left violence as well as 
in tenable situations on the ground. This is just an example to say how complex the situation is today and how difficult to make the adequacy of our legal instruments, our protection and assistance bases that we have with regard to the complexity of the phenomenon. I'll stop it here and leave uh, Filippo uh, to make his comments and it's more important to listen to the questions and to engage the discussion. Mr. Grandi. Yes, good evening and <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me here. You know, Sergio has been, as for many of, any of us here, a role model and a mentor and a former colleague, of course, and uh, it is very significant for me personally, as for many of us, to be speaking uh, in, uh, at an evening which is in his name. And because it is in his name, I also thought of, uh, of sharing a small memory which uh, illustrates what I want to say to begin with. Uh, it was, I think, 1996, forgive me if I go back a bit, and uh, Sergio was then the coordinator for the Great Lakes region, and uh, he was also the assistant high commissioner for refugees, and uh, I was a young uh, uh, official of the UNHCR, and he called me to his office, and he explained to me what we all knew, that there was this very difficult situation developing between the border of Rwanda and the then Zaire, war, refugees being chased out of their camps, a very dramatic and almost desperate situation. You know, we tend to always think that the latest crisis is the worst. We forget that we've gone through pretty difficult ones in the past as well. And then in typical Sergio's fashion, you know, in a very calm but I assure you, a very intense way, he told me, there's two things to be done here. He said, first, uh, we have to reaffirm the fundamental principles that are being violated, because they're very important, even when it appears that they're lost forever. And second, we must be remain relevant to a solution for the situation, even at this very, very extreme stage. And therefore, he said, pack your bag and go. So the rest, of course, of this story is history and all that happened uh, in the forests of Zaire in that fateful 1996. But I think that some of the lessons that you know, I draw from that brief encounter are still valid today as we face uh, we at UNHCR, we in the international commu in humanitarian community face new challenges. You all know the figures. We are now, UNHCR counts 60 to 70 people, 70 million people of our concern, 70 if you include the, the stateless, multiple crises, perhaps more crises than we've ever seen before, and a real dramatic lack of solutions, especially, I would say, in Africa, but, but also in other places. Let me, however, zoom to the area that at the moment we're all looking at, which is Europe. And we don't know because as we speak, the European Council is deliberating what to do on uh, how to respond, once again, is deliberating on how to respond to the so-called refugee and migrant crisis. But although we don't know the outcome of the solutions, we are very concerned about certain elements that are already quite obvious, that have already occurred. The, 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 the failure of European states to cooperate with each other, the resulting closing of the borders one by one, the burden being placed on some states, those receiving refugees like Greece now, others that have taken a big share like Germany, Sweden and Austria. We're worried about so many protection needs of all people arriving remaining unaddressed with the consequence diminishing of their dignity. This is one of the themes of, uh, of, this, uh, of this evening. And of course, we are also worried about the huge amounts of money being mentioned, money that unfortunately one has to suppose may not be available for other crises in other parts of the world, which are severely underfunded. 30% 
20 or 30 percent funding Central African Republic, as far as UNHCR is concerned. Even Iraq, a country full of displaced people, is, is a very underfunded operation. Of course, it's different now from that year, 1996, which, by the way, is 20 years ago. But now, too, we have, from I speak from the UNHCR perspective, a crisis of asylum, of basic principles, and accompanied by an absence of political solutions. The, like Peter said, people come from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, where political solutions have either not been found or are painfully being found in a slow manner, or have been found and have failed to be maintained, as in Afghanistan. So one, of course, you know, the question that all this begs is, is what to do. And I think, again, I go back to Sergio's words. First, we have to continue, like Peter said, to reaffirm principles. And from the UNHCR point of view, this is, of course, the principle of asylum, which is a cornerstone of the international legal system. And it is especially important that this principle is preserved in Europe because, of course, 86% of the people that we deal with are not in Europe, but everybody outside Europe is looking at Europe to see how this will evolve in this continent. And, of course, we have to also help states manage asylum. We have, as he said, to be part of the solution. We have to be, in fact, proponents, actors of that, of that solution. And that is uh, very difficult, and we can talk about this uh, this uh, later. Uh, but much more, of course, much more than this is needed. The inadequate handling of the crisis in 1996, both politically and from the humanitarian point of view, led to consequences in Central Africa that we're still dealing with today. One of our most acute emergencies, as of course I'm sure is the case for ICRC, is in Burundi and in neighboring countries. And of course, uh, the, the, the repercussions of mishandling this particular crisis in Europe, both from the political and humanitarian point of view, will have long-term repercussions, instability in the broader region. The, the Syrians arriving in Europe in the last couple of years, I think, have brought to us many messages. Of course, they're first and foremost their message, the message that I also could see in, in the Greek islands, the message of suffering, of the reasons why they're coming. But I think they also brought an important message because of the complexity that Peter was mentioning. That because of this complexity, this is refugee crisis, crisis of human mobility, let's call them like this, cannot be handled anymore by one state or one group of state. The burden is still very non-equally shared, and it is important to find new ways to share that responsibility more, more globally. And of course, even more importantly, we have to find better ways to solve those conflicts that cause the exodus of the people. Um, I would like to conclude by saying that all, having said all this, and going back to the central theme of this evening, the worst failure, of course, is the offense that is brought to people's dignity. And the main offense that is brought to people's dignity is for them to be utilized for political purposes. And unfortunately, like it has happened in many other situations, we see it even in Europe today, people are used for political purposes. That is the indignity against which I think it is important that we keep very strong our ability to remain indignant. Thank you. Thank you, uh, High Commissioner. I think we've all been shocked by the images we've seen of uh, children's bodies washing up on the beaches, of bodies left in trucks on the sides of our highways, of, of families huddling in the freezing rain in, in muddy camps, of desperate refugees tripped by journalists or, or beaten by police. And, and just yesterday, I think, 25 people drowned trying to cross from from Turkey to Greece. And then we hear that families are sending their children unaccompanied on, on trains through the whole of Central America to reach uh, the United States. We hear that people 
are still today, despite the civil war in Yemen, trying to cross from the Horn of Africa to Yemen, uh, to reach uh, Yemen and through Yemen, other uh, Gulf countries. So, uh, Ms. Maria, the, the ICRC, as you said, is a field-based organization. It has a presence uh, on the ground in the countries of origin. Can you, uh, you've already alluded to us, but can you tell us a little bit more what are the factors pushing people to leave their homes on such perilous journeys? I mean, what, what are the main root causes of displacement today? And, and with the scale of it, is it really a new phenomenon? As Filippo said beforehand, it's always difficult to, to clearly assess what is new and what we have seen before. But what we know is that we have seen a pattern of behavior in conflict emerging, which are all violations of international humanitarian law exposing increasingly civilians to violence. Instead of being spe specifically protected people, they have become specific targets of warfare and increasingly involved in warfare. Warfare has become urban. The Syrian crisis is a good example where the vulnerabilities are higher and therefore the cumulative effect of using force in densely populated area has left more people without elementary needs to subsist a normal life. It has become difficult to access, and that's what Filippo alluded to, on instrumentalizing victims for political purposes. Access has become, access to populations in need has become a critical area and a critical challenge. And therefore, still we are confronted with conflicts where millions of people and hundreds of thousands and millions of people are living without the possibility to access them and give them basic humanitarian uh, services and basic social services which the state cannot offer anymore as the conflict is unfolding. So it's a combination of violence, lack of access, which basically renders a human and dignified life impossible. What is lacking is food, shelter, medicine, water, sanitation, education for children. And interestingly enough, all these has become, have the, become core elements of a difficult uh, and precarious humanitarian action today. Lack of access, it has been everywhere in the, in the news. And in those situations, it's difficult to live a, a dignified life. Both of us this year, uh, Filippo and myself, have been in Syria. I've been in Syria last week. And you are confronted, and we are confronted, with people who have been four or five times or six times displaced before they decide to leave Syria. After five years of conflict, we have seen multiple displacements and degrading social services and availability of basic uh, uh, goods to survive in many parts of Syria. And, and this is what we are talking about when we talk about uh, dignified life in conflict. And last week, again, in the Syrian conflict and in many other conflicts, has strengthened to me the conviction that it is not only about assisting with what is elementary in order to stabilize societies and lives and livelihoods of people where they are, preferably. It is also protecting them from the violence. And here may be a little bit of a nuance. We, we all are used to say we need political solutions. Of course, we need political solutions. But we also know that these political solutions will not come forward in any foreseeable future and will not offer the political stability. So there is a room to occupy between gruesome warfare and its impact on people today and a political solution which may come forward in five or 10 years, or even if it comes forward in one year, it's late. We need to occupy the space in between. And this space is inadequately occupied because it is occupied by fighters who target civilians, who target civilian infrastructures, 
which lead to massive system failures, as we have observed them in the front lines of humanitarian response. It not, it's not only individuals who are suffering from the violence and from the lack of assistance. It's systems which do not respond to basic human needs. Health systems are falling apart. Educational systems are falling apart. The impact of the conflict targets neighboring countries and makes those social systems which are in neighboring countries increasingly fragile and unresponsive to people. We have a chain reaction and the chain reaction is called mass migration by force. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. As uh, Ms. Mara has just said, you were recently in, in the Middle East, in Syria, in in Jordan and in other uh, neighboring countries. You were also in Ethiopia, I think, where you've met with the Eritrean refugees. So what did you hear from them and what was your message to them? Were you tempted to tell them that the streets in Europe are not all paved with gold and that they would be also uh, encountering tremendous hardship on the way and even maybe in Europe? You know, I think it's a bit difficult when and so many colleagues or former colleagues will know that very well. When, when you're faced with refugees in a countries neighboring the, the country where the conflict is, so usually those are not countries endowed with a lot of resources, and therefore assistance, support to refugees is minimal. And certainly this is the case in the countries neighboring Syria. We, can talk about that as well, but up to now that assistance has been very limited because of the sheer size, magnitude of the crisis and uh, um, the scarcity of resources. So it's a bit difficult to be faced by refugees saying, I want to go to Europe or, and say, you know, look, don't go because it's, it's, it's not that good. You know, this is something that you find yourself at a bit, you, you, you find this yourself a bit embarrassed to almost say, although this is the message coming from Europe, by the way, but this is uh, not something that maybe as High Commissioner or even as a refugee worker, I would be prepared to say. Um, now, a couple of things. I think that we must recognize, of course, that not all those refugees will be able to move to third countries, and that certainly there is an increasing trend, and I am pretty sure that we will see more of it even in the next few hours and days to close the way of those people towards richer country. Uh, in the name of managing this flow, there's a lot of restrictions that have been put, and I think those are realities that we have to contend with. We can criticize, we can try to propose alternatives, but they will exist. So this is a reality that we need to speak to refugees about, and we certainly, we certainly do. But I think you have to offer them something in, in counterpart for that. And uh, there is where we, as organizations working with those impacted by conflict need the help of states to get those alternatives or to get those uh, those not compensations but you know those uh, more positive things to tell refugees as we tell them that uh, the avenue to the richer world is is closed i think first of all we need to assist them better and in a more adequate way where they are and this, you know, recently the London conference in respect of Syrians has, was designed precisely to do that. And the amount of resources pledged there, $11 billion, and the type of resources, not just for immediate relief, which is nevertheless still necessary, but also for longer term needs of the refugees like education and jobs and longer term needs of the host communities and states. All this was, was, was finally um, uh, promoted by the London Conference and hopefully it will be realized. I must tell you that we haven't seen much yet by way of concrete expenditure in that direction, but we hope that it is just a matter of bureaucracy and that that type of assistance will go in the direction of refugees and improve their conditions where they must 
stay whether they like it or not. The second point that I'd like to make is that increasingly we at UNHCR and many others are thinking that uh, since people, uh, in spite of even increased assistance, may still want to try and jump on those boats and cross the sea, we have to offer them alternatives to that, to those uh, irregular movement at the hands of uh, uh, smugglers that exploit them and um, at, you know, movements that cause instability, disorder, because obviously richer countries have not been able to deal with them. And that's why we are proposing, perhaps for the first time in a long, long time, I don't know, my uh, colleagues, my senior colleagues will know, this is probably the first time since the Indochinese crisis that we're offering, that we're urging states to offer legal pathways for admission of refugees to third countries in very large numbers. And the European Union is thinking along similar lines in part in its dealings with Turkey, but we haven't seen anything concrete yet coming out. Now, this is not, in my opinion, the best because, of course, the best would be that people could go back to their country, Syria in this case, and rebuild it. But if, as Peter said, solutions are very slow to come, and in the present situation, those alternative solutions are important. Can I maybe uh, still uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, what also now Filippo has touched upon? Uh, I think we need from time to time an honest word also in public that the origins of the displacement movements that we have seen over the last couple of months with a dramatic increase will not disappear in any foreseeable future. And I think it is better to settle into this idea and then to see what has to be done than to pretend that we will soon have a solution and people will go back. Even if we have a solution, people will not go back to many of the places where they are coming from because these places are destroyed and uninhabitable as they are today. I can't imagine how a reasonable amount of people can go back to Aleppo or Homs as I have seen them in the last couple of weeks. It's rubbles, it's weapons contaminated, and there is no future for any sort of significant number of people to go back in a decent future. This leaves us with a double contradiction. The first contradiction we experience as ICRC at the front line each and every week we do more, and at the end of the week we see that the situation is worse. So the acceleration of the crisis on the ground is faster than our capacity to respond. As Filippo mentioned, we need finally to see and come forward. Those commitments who pretend that they are serious in expanding and responding to the crisis. And I think it is important to stabilize societies as good as we can from wherever people are displaced in order to change the dynamic. We have not yet arrived at the bottom of things. The second major contradiction is that we are confronted with is that as humanitarians, we have to insist on the principles, as Sergio and Filippo mentioned now in his introduction, we have to insist on principles and law and we need people to be protected by the states who have an obligation to protect those who are in need of protection. And on the other side, we need to be pragmatic, as also Filippo mentioned, uh, based on what Sergio uh, has told him. And pragmatism is about how can we scale up and how can European countries and other countries scale up the possibilities to integrate and to offer a livable life to those who are here. At the present moment, we have a major gap. And the gap is between a huge amount of people needing protection and a little amount of people being able to be integrated uh, where they are coming from. And we need to change this dynamic. And this dynamic has to be managed. And if it is managed by panic and fear, we won't manage it. It is only managed if we come forward with solutions. There are solutions education and 
training for people displaced, job creation for refugees, offering, as Jordan uh, just is thinking, uh, economic zones, particularly for laborers coming from, for refugee labor coming from Syria. There are practical solutions there, but they need to be embraced by political leaders. They have to be scaled, they have to be implemented, and they, the, the discrepancy between this enormous gap that insecuritizes, in particular, the continent of Europe and spoils and poisons the discussion on migration and refugees all over the world needs to be responded by practical means. Yeah, I also have a little extra point because the question included an important issue. Um, you know, when I was, you asked me, I went to Ethiopia, it's true, and uh, in, in this brief time in which I have been in this position, and uh, I went to an Eritrean refugee camp. Uh, it was interesting that uh, there I was confronted with the clear um, situation in which young people were saying, we have nothing here, uh, I will go to the Mediterranean and take a boat and go to Europe. So I, was, I had to give advice. Of course I gave advice not to do it, but then I said, what would prevent you from doing it? At least in, to some of them. And they said, well, you know, if we had scholarships, and we don't want scholarships to go and study in the United States or in fancy places. We want scholarships to stay here in this country. We speak the language. We can stay here until we can go back home. But even that small amount of money is not available. What I want to say is that this type of uh, solutions or temporary solutions, these are not long-term solutions, waiting for a conflict or a human rights situation to solve itself, are available in most other places at lesser cost, but they're not being addressed. The whole attention is now on finding solutions for people coming to Europe from the Middle East and stabilizing them there. I think there's many other situations in which stabilization is also needed, and they are even more penalized because, as I said already several times, but let me say it again, resources, there's no, there's no attention and resources are not uh, getting there. So they cross and they come to Europe too. And for those people, the, the, the way to come here is even more dangerous because they don't not only have the sea, but also the desert and a lot of other risks to face. Let me bounce back on this uh, High Commissioner. I mean, you, you said rightly we're obsessed with the crisis in, in Europe because we sit in the heart of Europe. But we also have people trying to reach Australia, languishing on Nauru, we have uh, parts of Africa being emptied by the violence of Boko Haram, and we have bold people adrift in the Bay of Bengal. So you've talked of 60 million, 62 million of people displaced, I think, today. Do you, does the ICRC, does IOM have the means to cope with the sheer scale of the emergency today? I would say that uh, uh, resources are lacking everywhere. I mean, it is well known that uh, our own needs have been met at the rate of about 50% for the last few years. And uh, uh, we will have to see whether there will be a better response to at least the Syria crisis this year. But I don't think that the overall average will be improved very much because I also fear that that greater response to Syria, I said it earlier, will drain resources from other uh, uh, responses that are equally uh, important. So uh, definitely uh, uh, there are many crises that are severely underfunded. And I think the challenge for us is to uh, find new ways to address those situation which are not resourced sufficiently. I must say that uh, we haven't mentioned this, perhaps because we deal too much with it every day, but this is of course a year of great crisis and last year was a year of great crisis, but because of that, perhaps some opportunities are emerging. This year we have had the London conference. Now, you know, in a few days, we at UNHCR will organize a conference to promote legal pathways for admission, as I said earlier, for Syrian refugees. This is, you know, if that works well, it is a model that could be applied to other 
situations. These are all alternatives to just putting money, if you wish. And then there is an intensified debate around the relationship between humanitarian aid and development aid, finally trying to bridge a gap that has existed as long as I have been involved in this kind of work, and this is unfortunately a very long time. So there, there's new momentum for that. There's new energy on the part of political and development actors to devise new instruments to address this, because it is very clear, I go back to Peter's point, uh, solutions are slow, crises are long, and in the case of refugees, people are in exile for a long time, or uh, people are displaced internally in many countries for a long time. So you need new tools, not only more resources, but new resources, new type of resources. I think that debate is actually quite interesting and promising. I hope that everybody will stay the course and really come up with very concrete solutions, which will address, in part, the problem of resources on how to address those uh, those uh, crises. Can I maybe say one word uh, uh, on on this one? I think it is important what Philippe said, but it's not uh, only a question of resources, and it's not only a question of international humanitarian agencies responding. I think it is important that. Uh, of course, we don't have the means at the present moment to cope in any satisfactory way with the dimensions of the problem. So there is a gap, and Filippo has mentioned what we need to do in order to scale. There is a question of access, even if we have resources. There is a question of behavior of parties to the conflict, and these are other types of issues. And if there is any meaning in the first article of the Geneva Conventions that states have an obligation to respect and ensure respect. This is also engaging behaviors and not only resources. You can only in a certain, to a certain extent, uh, sort of uh, look over ill behavior by paying it off and by having humanitarians come in to to fix the negative impact of ill behavior. But we need much more substantive engagements by states. We need much more substantive engagements by states who fuel some of those conflicts from arms deliveries to other supports without ensuring any behavior of those who get the weapons in terms of respect for international humanitarian law. And while I make a quite a uh, daring assertion here, but of course, a lot of vulnerabilities with which we are confronted would not exist if international humanitarian law would be respected. And a lot of people would not be forced to flee if we had another type of engagement and prioritization in state's agenda. I think what we see today is also the result of deprioritizing the needs of people compared to state interests that uh, is critical. And as long as we, as we have this kind of priorities being set by the key actors in the international arena, the result will be the result what we see. Uh, you put humanitarian concerns as fifth priority, you get humanitarian problems. You start to think that the humanitarian impact of these crises are hampering your own interest as a state, you start to get another dimension and another dynamic into the conflict. My point here is only we need more than just resources. We also need more actors, local actors. We need more own initiatives uh, by people more support for those initiatives. And uh, as we, we see, for instance, in some of the discussion that the World Bank is having today on fragility, we need more private sector investment, even in fragile contexts, in order to allow uh, business and normal life to come forward, even in situations where there is not uh, a sort of a perfect ramifications for uh, economic development. So what the ICRC is saying is that it's not so much a migration crisis as a protection crisis. So, and we, that we have failed to protect people in their countries of origin and on the way as well, and even in the countries of destination. But do you think it is time to revive the cons 
concept of responsibility to protect, which was very big in 2005 when it was adopted by the World Summit in, in, in New York and uh, mentioned in a number of resolutions, Security Council, General Assembly, Human Rights Council. Um, yet it fell into some, somewhat into disrepute after maybe what happened in Libya and so on. So in the face of these persistent atrocities that, that throw people uh, uh, on the roads, do you think we need to rethink the responsibility to protect today? I'm personally not so sure whether another concept will bring better policies. I would be happy if states would respect what is here and what they have subscribed to, whether they call it responsibility prote protect or, or, or anything else. What matters is basically engagement and what matters is to put the concern of humanity uh, the, of the humanitarian impact of war and violence in a much more prominent way on the political agenda. And if it comes in a much more prominent way on the political agenda, we will see actors behave differently in the field and according to the provisions of the Geneva Conventions. Again, I don't say that the conventions are immovable and, uh, and that we shouldn't think about Improving, I don't say. I don't think say that we shouldn't think about concept. What is more critical than concepts is the consensus of those who have influence that certain things are unacceptable, and decisive political action in order to say what is unacceptable. So uh, again, I I see the, that that. The responsibility to protect hasn't been a reunifying concept which has enhanced political action. If I would say it, I would embrace it immediately, but I don't see the result. And therefore, I'm basically back to square one, and my square one is the Geneva Conventions, and it's pretty clear what is legal, illegal, Licit, illicit in terms of the conventions and the conduct of hostilities, the treatment of detainees, the protection of civilians. Uh, if we had a couple of those fundamentals of humanity implemented through decisive state policy, we would, we would not have the end of war, we would not have a political solution of the problems, but we would have less impact uh, on civilian populations. But if we could stay a tiny little bit more a little longer on this legal aspects. I mean, uh, the normative framework that we have today to deal with uh, with people, uh, with displaced people, is very much a status-based uh, framework uh, inherited from the Second World War. Given the mixed migration flows that we see today, do we simply need to rethink the conventions? I mean, I know it's we need political action first, but in the meantime, do we also need to rethink um, the the 1951 Refugee Convention? I mean, is is the concept of non-refoulement blatantly disrespected today? Can you point the fingers at some states that are not respecting it? Do we need new instruments? I I I would agree with Peter that. The problem is not the instruments. The instruments are very good, actually, and perfectly usable if uh, efforts are made. Of course, those efforts have a political nature, so they require political will, let's put it that way. But uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the refugee treaties, the refugee convention, and all the related treaties are very good, very effective, and although they're old, some of them, they're they've also been complemented by many other regional instruments. So there's, there's a corpus, there's an apparatus there that in my opinion is very suitable to the protection of refugees. Now I would also make a small pitch. I don't think I differ from Peter here, but I think he will understand if I say that it is very important to preserve that recognition of status of refugees. As my predecessor said many times, and I would subscribe to that, a lot for various reasons. One of the main vulnerabilities 
if not the main vulnerability of refugees, is to be a refugee. To be a refugee is a vulnerability that needs to be protected, and those instruments help to do just that. The, prob the fact that they're not being observed, they're not being upheld, that they're being violated is not a reason to, <laughs> to put them in discussion. On the contrary, is perhaps, perhaps what we need to look at, as I said in my introduction, is better way to share that responsibility. Because in the end, it, it is true that it is always a matter of a few states bearing the brunt of this responsibility. Uh, in the case of Syria, it's certainly the neighboring countries, but uh, this happens in, in many other places. Again, Ethiopia is a country that hosts by itself 750,000 refugees, and it doesn't have the shadow of the type of assistance that other countries receive. So really that kind of responsibility, revisiting how that responsibility is shared, I think is in order. And I think that the efforts that are being made this year in that direction are positive. You know, that there will be a summit in September that proposed by the Secretary General, which will be hosted by the General Assembly, to look precisely at this at this issue. And of course, it will not look only at refugees, but it will look also at migrants. Now, that is not my field of expertise, so I won't venture too much into it, but it is very clear that migrants too have rights, although their framework may be different from that of refugees, and they also need to be able to enjoy some form of protection. So, you know, one thing does not exclude the other, but everything has to be looked at, looked at in its own merit and its own right. I want to add one point, though. To me, what, what is worrying is that, uh, I think Peter said earlier that the refugees have become, the, from being the victims, or the refugees and others, from being the victims now seem to be almost the culprits or the targets. That is a very serious thing. That's the politicization of the issue that I mentioned before. Instead of upholding the instruments that are available to states to protect refugees, quite the opposite is happening. And refugees are categorized as a threat. Now, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, speaks to the very concept of political leadership including in this continent. I will quote you a small anecdote. When I remember, I think Mrs. Ogata, the former High Commissioner, quotes it in her book of memoirs, but I was actually present when former Tanzanian President Nyerere told her that in the 70s, it had been very easy for him as a president to give citizenship to Burundian refugees. He said, you know, I was a dictator. I could do whatever I wanted. So it was very easy for me to just sign a decree and everything was fine. Now, I think that a few months ago, another very painful process of naturalization happened it, it, and it was much more difficult. He said himself, you know, you guys from the West have asked us to become democratic and here it is. Now it's much more difficult to promote the rights of refugees. Now the same is valid everywhere, I think, and it is very difficult to to obtain acceptance. It requires very courageous political leadership that uh, has to counter some natural fears and resistances. We have not seen this in Europe, except perhaps in the case of Chancellor Merkel and a few other ones. So that's the type of political leadership needed to uphold those instruments. May I just... Uh... Also, on, uh, following what Felipe uh, said, I think uh, I agree with you that status is critically important and we know it and we don't want somehow to dilute the significance of the instruments we have. I think one of the challenges for humanitarian actors today is to use the multiplicity of instruments that are here to protect people in an intelligent way in order to enhance the space for protection. And, and this is a challenge because at the end of the day, we have been used for a very long time. HCR to use the Refugee Convention and the ICRC to use the Geneva Convention and we will continue to do so. But when we look at the complexities of lives other protective instruments come into play. And this is a real challenge for humanitarian organization to see 
how can we use those protective instruments in an intelligent way in order to make a case? Because what is not good either is that we have people displaced by violence who just because they are within their own country are not, have, don't have the same level of protection that has a refugee. And so it is important today to become literate in many more areas than just in one convention and to use those conventions dynamically as we are confronted with more complex population movements and to see what is an ambitious agenda for protection. And then I uh, agree with the leadership uh, point that uh, Filippo mentioned and uh, just one addition to that. Leadership is not only at national level unfolding and what strikes me is how practical uh, it is, how important it is at the practical and local and regional level to have solutions. And I'm coming from the country you know, we are here. Uh, I have seen a lot as in my former capacities as an official of, of this country on how you can do better or worse at local and national level to find innovative solution to deal with the problems that you have. Because you have a problem when suddenly you are a community of 1,000 and you get 150 new kids uh, to the school. That's an objective problem. You need to solve it. And it needs uh, innovative approaches in terms of what is the best deal for protection that we get out of it. And I think it needs space and leadership to fill in order to come forward with practical solutions. And they exist. So maybe one, one last question on this before we, we go to the floor. But you've talked of the need for leadership, of the need for solutions at all level. But frankly, Europe today simply seems unable to address the question with the generosity and unity why is this? What, where will that lead us? I mean, today in Brussels, the discussions were on whether to close or not the Balkans route. So where, where do you see us in, with this in Europe in a few months? What, why this lack of unity? Difficult to respond, but at the end of the day, uh, do I... Uh, am I correct in the analysis that most European politicians, including in countries not members of the European Union, have the impression and read their publics and electorate as being afraid of refugees and therefore they formulate their policies as they read their publics. And they read their publics that way because their publics are silent or express themselves in that way. So while we all agree always that it needs space and leadership to find new solution, it also needs civil action to express because you can't imagine the European continent change its course without the European societies expressing themselves in a different way. And if they disagree with the interpretation that governments give about their expression, I think it needs political debate. And this political debate is lacking at the present moment or is narrowed down to a singular interpretation of what the desires of Europeans are. And I think without a broader expression of the fabrics of European societies, this dynamic will not change in a foreseeable future and then we will have the consequences that we have. I'm rarely praising my own country, but let me just remind yourself, uh, ourselves what has happened a week ago in a public uh, vote in this country. It has shown that the public, when asked and informed and being confronted with an evidence-based and intelligent debate, they know where to put priorities. And I think we need this kind of debate in the European society in order to have a democratic process 
which produces better results in terms of the humanitarian concerns that we have at the present moment in the, in the way the continent deals with the refugee crisis. And without having cha changing this at the, ba at the basis, this will not happen. Well, let's hope this is... Uh... Let's hope this is the start of this uh, intelligent debate. So we'll take questions from the floor now. I've, I'm under strict instructions to favor young students. Apologies to the others. And please, uh, you can ask your questions in English ou en français. Our two speakers are French speaking too, so don't hesitate to ask questions in French as well if you want, Italian, German. But uh, let, let's stick to English and French for my sake, please. And. Uh, We'll start with the young man at the back. Please introduce yourself and say to whom the question is addressed. Thank you. Shall I stand up? It's as you wish. You, you can, can see, see me. You. Yes. Good. Uh, Nassim Arouz, uh, lawyer in public law. So I'd like to ask a question to both. So you both mentioned the uh, European Union. So on the one hand, we have member states that um, decided to open uh, the borders and act with humanity, just like Germany. We have, on the other hand, member states that decided to close their borders and build, build um, uh, what, walls, for example, in Hungary. Uh, in addition, the European Union has granted for the first time to a member state uh, a humanitarian uh, help, Greece. Thus, and this is my question, do you think that the European Union failed to face this mass migration crisis, or do you think that there is a hope for the European, the European Union to answer uh, migrants' safety and dignity? Thank you. Would you like to start? Um, I would, um, um, maybe a few comments. This is a very important question. Uh, first of all, and this is also in part a reply to what was asked earlier, just to complete. I think and, and this is uh, this is an area that is beyond my my remit. But just as a general comment, as a European, perhaps um, it is very clear that you know Europe made right decisions. If you look at the decisions made in response to the crisis in 2015, from one point on, they were not bad. The famous hotspots, the registration, the distribution through the willing countries, several were willing to take people, the so-called uh, relocation, uh, etc. There were a series of fairly good decisions, but the, the, the fact is that none of them was implemented. And I think in that lack of implementation lie many factors. Some may be structural. That is that the European Union has not sufficiently developed mechanisms to make those difficult decisions together. This is a much broader issue than just refugees and migrants. This is a structural issue of the, of the European Union, perhaps linked to a very rapid expansion in the 90s, and subsequently, I, you know, I'm not an expert and I cannot analyze, but certainly it was a, 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 an alarm bell that I'm sure European leaders are looking at very carefully or should be looking at very carefully now. But that's a more, uh, that's a broader comment. Uh, the, the other comments that I would say is that I don't, in more direct response to your question, I don't despair that Europe can rise up to the occasion. But in order to do that, and I paraphrase what Peter said earlier, it's the same thing, it has to tap into its forces that want that to happen. You know, when, when, um, when, uh, when people, you know, you see this on the islands in Greece, people are welcoming those suffering other people that are coming. I'm saying something very simple here. In my own country, in Italy, this definitely happened. In spite of the political noise to the contrary, there was a lot of solidarity. And look at Germany and Central Europe during the summer. And I think that when the Chancellor of Germany said, you know, Syrians are welcome, one can have many judgments on that rather strong call, but definitely it disenfranchised solidarity. Solidarity be became all of a sudden something you could 
talk about again. There was a debate around, it was not just push them away because they take our jobs, they, uh, they threaten our security and so forth. Of course then, you know, much as that happens one way, it can go the other way immediately, you know, especially after what happened in Cologne in the, in the, in win, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, or even worse, what happened in Paris. Of course the debate can shift. And here I only go back to my previous argument. You need very strong, coherent, and fairly steady, courageous leadership to, to stay that course. But you also need to realize, everybody needs to realize that those decisions, I go back to my first point, that were making the first, made in the first place were good, were implementable, and if they had been implemented a year ago or six months ago, would have probably made this whole flow much more manageable and therefore less threatening to that public opinion that is so scary for the leaders. Can I just add to uh, uh, what Ripe said? Of course, there are decisions which uh, haven't been implemented, and then there are decisions which haven't been taken, and unilateral decisions which have a humanitarian impact. And the unilateral decision which have a humanitarian impact, of course, are problematic in terms of do no harm. I mean, these are policies which do harm if at the end of the day people are stranded in between borders in situations which do not allow a normal life. It's just reinforcing the problem that we are dealing with. So the lack of finding in time political decisions and to have unilateral decisions from member states of the European Union, which today force the HCR and ICRC to be present on the Mediterranean's North Rim is extremely problematic. When I started my job at ICRC in 2012, I thought we would never put our foot again on any major operation on the European continent. We have our sixth largest operation today worldwide in Europe, which is Ukraine, the Donbass. And we are just being pushed to operationalize our advice to the Greek government, which has been expert advice on what we can offer as an advice into something more meaningful. And this is highly unnormal, and it's picking up the pieces of unilateral decisions which do not care about the humanitarian consequences that it has for the people and for the neighboring host countries. Thank you. Do we have another question? I see a person here, seems relatively young, so I think it's acceptable. <laughs> there with a blue shirt, yeah. Can you stand up, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a student here at the Graduate Institute, LLM International Law. Um, so, consistent with the theme of Serio de Mello, um, I have the aid workers in mind as well. And I'd like to ask the question to both um, uh, heads of ICRC and UNHCR, that considering the situation and the magnitude of the crisis, you mentioned 60 to 70 million people of concern, and that there are already more than 1 million people, uh, migrants and refugees in Europe. What are the initiatives of your um, organizations in order to respond to the change of times. If there is any um, change, for example, administratively, like boosting um, uh, partnerships of private sector, which is very active in Europe, and as well as um, employment, boosting employment as well, as the capacity on the ground is already very much stretched, and maybe, uh, you know, what, what are the initiatives um, right now of your respective organizations? Thank you. Maybe if I can start on that, this is a, a problem which we f fortunately do not have and are not too worried about because the positive uh, impact of the present crisis in Europe and beyond is 
that we have never seen in the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement, such an enormous mobilization of volunteers to deal with the problems. This is true for Syria, where we have 12,000 volunteers working for the Syrian Arab Red Crescent and ICRC, and it is true for many competent national societies on the migration path. I'm impressed to see Greek volunteers, Italian volunteers, who have sacrificed their lives and, and, they, and they, they have come and, and stepped up to the plate and have responded where there was no state response. So in terms of mobilization of energy, everything is here. We don't lack resources in terms of human resources and young committed people helping a professional response to the humanitarian crisis. The second question is a little bit more complicated if you allude to new forms of partnership. I, true, I do believe that when I go back to my image that we have on the one side protection needs and on the other side we have integration capacities and both do not match. We need to somehow do something in between and there we need other types of partnership also with the private sector. Some countries have, uh, again, modeled it quite ably. The German industry and, and business community has responded much more generous than other business communities in offering trainings and offering jobs uh, to refugees. I think we need these kind of partnerships to find sustainable solutions. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think that uh, the, the features of the current huge crisis or multiple crises are really so many conflicts and so many different emergencies are the need to address uh, to address requirements that are very protracted in time and very big not just in Syria but in many other places and perhaps a renewed emphasis or uh, how can I say interest in how do you integrate people that cannot go back to their countries? Local integration, if you call it, in Europe, but in other places as well. These are the challenges. They're not entirely new, but the scale is perhaps new and requires, I would agree with Peter. Here it's, you know, we all have our own important protection tools. We'll continue to uphold them, but we need to work together very closely with new partners in addressing the material needs. I, um, I, um, uh, you know, I think it is interesting what, what I, I said it already earlier, let me repeat it again. I think that the current debate on developing new tools by the World Bank, for example, or uh, other uh, or regional banks or developmental actors that previously were not really involved in addressing this type of needs, the work that they're doing to try to adapt their financing tools, their loan, loan system and other financial instruments to this type of situation is remarkable. It's very difficult and it will require also governments to accept some modifications to those tools. But I think it is, you know, the, the push of the crisis is such that it is creating momentum in that direction. On the private sector, I would say also the private sector, of course, comes in with resources and interest when there is a high profile crisis, they get mobilized. I think it is incumbent on us to capture that interest and to make it adapted to the type of needs. And it is not just money, I also agree with that. It is training, for example, definitely. You know, I was recently in Japan and um, uh, we, we, we have a very interesting partnership with a very big retail company. And uh, they insist that they just they give us quite a lot of assistance, money and in-kind assistance, but they insist that they want other dimensions. They want to train refugees uh, in countries where they find themselves or even in, in countries where they are resettled. And I think that is invaluable because it, it, it contributes to the, to the third part that I was mentioning, which is integration. I think it is in integration where we will probably have the biggest challenges. And whilst this used to be a problem in developing countries, in countries with less resources, it is becoming an issue also here in, in, um, in, 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 in the industrialized world because of the political uh, context that we have described earlier. So I think it's important to partner with 
other actors in looking at this new challenge or new scale of the challenge? So let's, I mean, I don't want to inhibit all the people too much, but here, here, let's have one over there also, up there, and then, and then are there some afterwards? Maybe we'll take two questions at a time. There's one there, and then one over there. We can take the two questions and then respond. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, we've spoken a lot about Syrian refugees coming to Europe, but of course the mass migration movement to Europe is not just Syrian refugees. How do we address the diversity of these mass migration movements when you have different legal designations for different types of nationalities, not just in Europe, but for example, Palestinian refugees who have been displaced first to Syria but now in Lebanon, where they have different legal rights in those circumstances? Thank you. Let's take the uh, another question here. Yeah. Oui, bonsoir. En fait, euh, ma question, ça va être plutôt en français. I can do in English, but actually, it's Geneva, so... En français, <laughs> uh, c'est bon. Juste une question, en fait, on a, on a développé la notion de responsabilité des États. De responsabilité des États par rapport, en fait, à la protection des, des demandeurs d'asile et des migrants, dans, les cas, dans ce cas-là, en fait, des réfugiés. Est-ce que vous croyez que des directives des organisations régionales comme l'Union européenne ou internationale, donc plutôt, plutôt cas, devient plus faillite au niveau de la protection de la dignité et, et des demandeurs d'asile. Par exemple, le règlement de Dublin, il est plus en fait uh, bearable. Uh, tu implémentes en fait par les États de l'Union européenne. Est-ce que aussi la responsabilité des États doit aussi se pratiquer pas seulement en fait dans les pays en fait des de destines mais aussi dans les moments en fait les demandeurs il y a plus de chances de d'arriver au, au destin de la protection aussi pendant les transits parce que on met en fait euh, des gens euh, au danger euh, au moment juste en fait de se amener en Europe ou dans d'autres pays est-ce que aussi ça va représenter en fait une autre obligation par les États aux faces des, des gens Merci. Très bien. Donc, deux questions. One on, on the difficulty really of dealing with the people of many different status, and one on the responsibility of states. Shall we? Uh, on the on, of course, it is not just Syrians. What is interesting, however, is that you, if you look at the statistics, I, I, I think I'm not mistaken. More than 90 percent of the people that have arrived in Europe during this crisis are people that come from the 10 countries that produce the most refugees. So this is essentially still very much a refugee flow. Although, of course, there are people that come from countries that are not usually producing refugees and perhaps are not refugees in the traditional sense, so they should be. But, but you know, it's, if you take the Syrians and the Afghans, and the Iraqis, they constitute the bulk of the people that are arriving in Europe. And of course, our position has always been that everybody deserves, merits, the institutional and practical attention that those situations justify and warrant. Uh, there is a rather dangerous tendency of uh, categorizing these groups by nationality. So all uh, Syrians in, all Afghans out, and we really uh, refuse that uh, position, which may well prevail. We have to see what happens by tonight. I am, I should say that I, I gave a, a maybe a rather optimistic reply about the, you know, Europe in the end or getting organized, but I'm very concerned about what the Council is debating and will conclude tonight in terms of response, precisely, you know, because of, also because of all these groups. But certainly, for example, in the case of Afghans, uh, they should be, their case should be heard on the merit of their case. And we know that the situation is very, not equal in the various parts of Afghanistan. Sure, they should, they sh it should be examined on a case by case basis. And of course, the Palestinians, we, the Palestinians that will arrive most likely are people that are coming from Syria. So in a way, they are fleeing for exactly the same reasons as the Syrians not of Palestinian origin 
are fleeing. So definitely, in in that case, it seems to me even more more uh, obvious. But I know that they face a lot of difficulties. I was in Germany a few weeks ago and met a group of Palestinians, and they were having great problems, also from the institutional point of view, family reunification point of view, and and uh, and so and so forth. Sur la l'autre question, je ne suis pas sûr si j'ai compris. La responsabilité des États. Oui, je ne suis pas non plus sûr que j'ai 100% compris, mais euh, dites-moi si j'ai compris. Euh, après, euh, ce, moi j'ai mentionné avant ce qui nous préoccupe ou ce qui est un défi aujourd'hui, c'est la multiplicité d'instruments globaux, régionaux et nationaux euh, qui doivent être pondérés par les États dans leur utilisation et argumenter. En tant qu'humanitaire, c'est relativement clair quel est notre devoir. Notre devoir, c'est d'utiliser ces instruments pour voir quel est le meilleur régime de protection juridique qu'on peut tirer dans, un, dans une panoplie d'instruments euh, qui est aujourd'hui là et quelles sont les solutions pratiques qu'on peut offrir aux États. Donc, c'est important qu'on regarde tous ces niveaux ensemble et qu'on regarde quelle est la précision ou, ou quel est la, le système normatif le plus précis qui nous permet euh, d'avoir un niveau de protection adéquat aux problèmes auxquels on est confronté. Et, et je pense que euh, ces instruments sont nationaux, régionaux et globaux en même temps et il est important qu'on aide les États à interpréter d'éventuelles différences entre ces instruments. Et puis pour le reste, j'aimerais aussi insister sur ce que Filippo a dit sur l'appréciation euh, individuelle des raisons de protection. Il ne peut pas y être le sens d'un système de protection qu'on privilégie une catégorie pour exclure une autre. Ce qui est possible dans le sens du système de protection qu'on a, c'est qu'on privilégie une catégorie et puis qu'on offre au moins un minimum euh, aux autres, n'est-ce pas Mais aujourd'hui, j'ai quand même peur que l'exclusion de certaines nationalités d'un droit à l'appréciation individuelle de leur raison de réfugier soit une entrave massive au système de protection euh, qui est à disposition. Donc, c'est un vrai problème auquel euh, on est confronté. Et dans ce sens, je pense qu'il est important, je reconnais le problème pratique, parce que là, Corinne, vous, vous, vous l'avez dit, c'est les, les nombres qui ne permettent pas aux machineries euh, existantes de faire cette appréciation à un rythme et avec, une, euh, avec des soins nécessaires. Mais si c'est le cas, il faut trouver des solutions temporaires ou bien euh, euh, croître les possibilités, les capacités de gérer euh, le problème. Il n'y a pas tellement d'alternatives. Je suis entièrement d'accord. Je voulais simplement ajouter, un, qu'il s'agit... C'est des instruments. C'est des instruments qui sont à la disposition des États pour faire face à des situations et qui offrent beaucoup de nuances différentes. Si vous vous souvenez, euh, pendant les guerres euh, balkaniques, dans les années 90, euh, tout le concept de la protection temporaire qui avait été développé pour que les Bosniaques puissent être accueillis en Allemagne et dans d'autres pays, était une certaine évolution de, de l'application du droit des réfugiés, qui a eu beaucoup de succès, parce qu'à l'époque, on avait pu résoudre beaucoup de problèmes à travers l'application pratique de ce concept, que le HCR, avec les États européens, avait développé. Donc, quand il y a volonté politique de, de développer des, euh, des, des solutions pratiques basées fermement dans les principes des instruments, c'est toujours possible de le faire. Le, la deuxième observation que je voulais faire, c'est que c'est très important, je l'ai dit dans mon introduction, mais un peu vite, euh, ce que l'Europe va, va, va décider maintenant et dans les prochaines semaines et mois, ce qu'elle a déjà décidé, malheureusement pas toujours très bien dans les mois passés, a une valeur qui va au-delà de l'Europe. Ça, c'est très clair. Nous observons déjà, avec beaucoup de préoccupations, plusieurs pays dans d'autres continents qui nous disent, bon, écoutez, vous nous demandez 
nous qui avons très peu de ressources, d'accueillir un nombre de réfugiés qui est parfois plus important de celui qui est hébergé par certains pays européens, si eux peuvent se permettre de le refuser, nous on va faire la même chose, demander à d'autres de prendre ces réfugiés. On le voit déjà, c'est pour ça que le, le, ce que l'Europe fait a une valeur double en soi et en tant qu'exemple négatif, mais espérant positif vis-à-vis -vis le reste du monde. Let's, let's take two more questions uh, all at once, yes, and uh, we'll take them together in the center here. We have, uh, I think, two questions here in the center, uh, and those will be the last ones, because after these questions, we'll have to uh, wrap the debate up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mao and Mr. Grandi, um, for that really interesting discussion. My name is uh, Jörn from the Fragile States and Disaster Response Group of the ILO. I'm an intern. Um, my question is, we spoke a lot about politics and political will. Um, if you would put yourself in the shoes of politicians today, how would you approach the Turkish government? Uh, would you decide for human rights uh, in the sense of press freedoms, or would you rather go for um, refugees' rights? What? How would you cope with that situation? We'll take the second question. It will give them time to think about this, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm also an intern with IOM in the health division. And my question is that we have already explained that mass migration is a global phenomenon and is much happening in more in the middle, like it's happening around the world than the Middle Eastern crisis that we are seeing now. So I just want to draw back to the conversation that we're having about ensuring people's safety and dignity. And I want to draw attention to other types of migration, apart from seeking asylum, particularly economic and environmental migrants. So my question is to hopefully start a discussion about how such migrants are described as choosing to leave. And I want to draw some uh, personal anecdotes when I was living in Haiti. So Haiti is the, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And every indicator from health to education is drastic. And the country was facing prolonged drought when I was living there. And during the time that I was there, it was also during a period where Dominican Republic was trying to chase back Haitians back into Haiti. So from what I see, I cannot ensure that their lives, the Haitian lives, are safe and dignified when they cannot feed their children, when they are faced with violence and idleness because they have nothing to do. So um, I just want to ask for your opinion on how do we evaluate such a situation and how do we assess who is really more in need than another? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to take the question about what you would say to Turkey? <laughs> I, I, I will, you know, you, you cannot be, put me in a too difficult a position. I will simply say that, of course, between Europe and Turkey, the dialogue is very diverse. There's a lot of things that are at stake, ranging from accession or not to Europe, to what happens in the meantime, visas and so forth, to uh, human rights, to uh, now refugees. I am sorry, but I have to focus on this last point. And on this last point, I would first and foremost recognize that Europe has taken, um, sorry, Turkey, has taken the largest number of refugees of any other country on earth right now. They are the biggest, the largest refugee hosting country. And frankly, although conditions are not always easy for refugees, they're probably better than in other countries. The effort is there to try to uh, exercise to an extent, to the extent possible, in a form of forms of protection. Uh, Turkey recently uh, allowed Syrian refugees to work at certain conditions. So there are positive efforts that need to be recognized. This is why any talk about sending back refugees to Turkey, because this is a big talk at the moment, should take into account that maybe, you know, if we talk about sharing the burden, you know, and you send them back to the country that already has the biggest burden. But in any event, I think that what is important is to continue to tell Turkey that that regime of relatively good assistance and protection, it's not perfect, you know, Turkey is not, doesn't fully apply the refugee convention, there are technicalities there that are quite important, has to improve even further, and that, however, 
offers that are substantive have to be made for that responsibility to be shared. This is why of all the various pieces of discussion that are going on at the moment under the joint action plan, so-called, to us the most important is how to help Turkey uh, uh, share that, or bear that responsibility or lighten that responsibility by taking people. Those people that want to go abroad because of different needs, vulnerabilities, or perhaps not vulnerabilities, but skills and strengths should be helped, but not so that they don't resort to irregular means, but they go on a plane instead of on a boat. But this has to be done not in the tens, not in the thousands or tens of thousands as has been done so far, but in the hundreds of thousands. So that is the discussion that definitely if I were a European leader I would have with Turkey. I think it is probably part of the discussion, but it is in the middle of many other, and, and I fear conditional to other measures that uh, are, are different. Mr. Maurer, maybe on the, I don't know whether you wanted to say something on this, but otherwise maybe on how to really assess the needs of the people who want to leave their homes. Let me just uh, also in terms of proportions, I briefly alluded in my introduction and uh, you had with Filippo and me two persons dealing in particular with the vulnerabilities of migrants who are displaced by force. That's the core of our mandate and that's what we most have discussed tonight. And that's the 60 to 70 million that Filippo has mentioned and, and either uh, internally displaced or refugee. This adds up roughly to that number. There are 250 million people on the move. And some of them have specific vulnerabilities and need other policies and need other priorities to address. So you are right in raising those issues. Uh, it just needs other agencies to deal with those issues and other policies and it's not in the core of our mandate, not because we don't think it is important to deal with, the, with those who have specific vulnerabilities and are not displaced by violence. Uh, it's a critical issue, it's a core issue and it needs to be addressed and we of course, uh, uh, it needs to be mentioned as to, to make the, the, picture, the picture clear. We have focused on those who are displaced by violence and which are of a particular political concern at the present moment. It doesn't say anything about the 160 or plus other millions in the world who may have vulnerabilities other than those which we have mentioned tonight. On the other thing, let me just be very uh, clear with regard to the to the Turkey issue, just on adding also what uh, Filippo mentioned before. As humanitarians, we are used to dilemmas. And we are in the middle of dilemmas, and at the end of the day, we are always seeking for practical solutions which are better assisting and protecting people in enhancing their human dignity. So it's a question of tactics and not of principles. All these issues may have, may be contradictions, but they are not contradictions in practice. They are, con they are false contradictions when there is, an, there is no alternative of either focusing on aspirational human rights or focusing on refugee rights. Uh, we have a certain mandate with regard to people displaced by force and we have a, quite, a kind of dialogue and states should have this kind of dialogue and it doesn't exclude other files. And statescraft is about setting priorities and trade-offs and dealing with dilemmas and, use it and, and looking what is more urgent today than, than tomorrow. This is what diplomacy and shaping relations is and I think the European Union should uh, engage in prioritizing those issues which are priority at the present moment and I think they do it. Uh, what is a little bit of a problem, and Filippo mentioned it beforehand, and it's not specific to Turkey, but uh, of course if big money enters that game, the discussion becomes and risks to lead us to another place. And I think it is important always to see, and if I were a leader of a political leader, 
I would try to focus the, the discussion on practicalities and substance and to have an evidence-based debate instead of having a debate around money and how much keeping a refugee instead of letting him go uh, is the trade-off. That's maybe the wrong discussion and the wrong discussion I would like uh, not to find myself in if I were a politician. Thank you very much. I think the last word belongs to Anne Willem, but thank you very much to our speakers. We've heard about leadership and the need for practical solutions and the need for informed debate. So thank you very much again, really. <laughs> If the EU Council members could have had a pause during this time and through streaming could have listened to our panelists, I think maybe we would have a good decision coming out of it later tonight. But let's hope for the best that through telepathy your thoughts are flying to uh, Brussels. With that, I really would like to thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring uh, discussion. Also, Corinne, you did a wonderful job in keeping the two <laughs> on their edge. <laughs> And I also would like to thank the Graduate Institute, Professor Burin, Jacqueline, and Dougal for having made this all possible. And thank you all for coming to this debate. Thank you. Thank you.